Good afternoon. A decade ago, providing every child with a customized education was just a dream. Thanks to technology today, that dream can become a reality. In a few moments, you'll hear from two national leaders who share a passion for bringing education into the digital age, an age you and I already live and work in. With digital learning, students can learn anywhere, at any time, and at their pace. Content is personalized so each student receives the education they need to succeed. We can also provide teachers with a chance to be inspiring professionals that they always dreamed to be. But how do we do that? Well, it's real simple. The adults and the policies we, need, we have need to match the dreams that we can have in our future. Last year, these education leaders presented us with the 10 elements of high quality digital education. Today, Digital Learning Now releases the first ever national digital learning report card, a comprehensive assessment of the state of digital learning in all of our states. In a few moments, Governor Bush and Wise will share the roadmap for reform for digital learning. These documents are serving us in Ohio as a foundation for our work to make sure that our laws and our policies match with those dreams that we hope will become a reality. This work is transformative and we're thrilled to be a part of it. I think you're going to be seeing a video. Is there a video coming? I guess not. I, I'm seeing it. This, ah, there it is. Technology has revolutionized the way we live, work, shop, and play. And it has the power to transform education. Imagine an education made just for you, personalized, engaging, challenging. That is the power of digital learning. Digital learning gives students control over where they learn, when they learn, and most importantly, how they learn. Computers, tablets, smartphones, technology of every kind lets students learn anywhere and everywhere, anytime and all the time. Technology makes knowledge accessible and learning portable. But the true promise of digital learning is its ability to customize education for each and every student. Engaging, interactive software can adapt instruction to the style and pace of each student, so no student is bored and no student is left behind. A decade ago, providing a customized education to millions of students across the nation was just a dream. Today, digital learning can turn that dream into reality. documents that Bob uh, mentioned, the governors not only made history, but also flipped it on its head. They wrote the Constitution before the revolution was realized. And I call it a revolution because it does two things. It empowers students and teachers, and it liberates them from the shackles of an antiquated, factory-style, one-size-fits-all system. Let me illustrate. I'm five foot three inches tall, an average height for a woman. If you place the Hope Diamond on a shelf, 10 feet on a wall above the ground, you could, and I had to jump to get it, I could train for 30 years and I would never be able to reach it. It would be impossible. Of course, if I were over six feet tall, I might have a shot at it, but there aren't too many six foot tall women around. However, if I had a ladder, all I would have to do is make sure that it's secure against the wall and learn to climb it. The Hope Diamond is differentiated learning, customized to enable each child to reach his or her full potential. And the, and the ladder is digital learning. With that tool, it becomes possible for the average teacher to achieve extraordinary results. Here is an example. KIPP Empower Academy in Los Angeles opened last year with 116 kindergartners, 98% African-American, 
uh, uh, eligible for free lunch. It's a newly developed blended model based on 28 st students in each classroom rotating between stints on the computers and small group and individual instruction. When they started the school in August of 2010, they tested 9% proficient on the, S the SAT-10. At the end of the school year, they tested 96% proficient on the math and reading parts of the same test. Satisfaction ratings for parents were 96% and for teachers, 88%. So yes, teachers love this. In the second decade of the 21st century, we can no longer demand the impossible from our teachers. We have to make available to them the, the tools we you all use in our everyday lives to increase our productivity and to improve our work product. The two gentlemen I'm going to introduce, both have had distinguished careers as dedicated public servants, but I know that they will best be remembered for having launched the revolution that transformed the way our children learn. Please help me to welcome Governor Bush and Governor Wise. Go ahead, boss. Thank you again. Thank you, Giselle. I, for some odd reason, I just don't think uh, that Hope Diamond would have had been gotten with a ladder with Giselle. Just, <laughs> I think she probably would have jumped six feet to grab it. Giselle, thank you so, thank you so much for your revolutionary spirit. Um, it's great to be equated to a founding father. I'm certainly not that, nor is Bob, but they were pretty cool guys. Wish we had a few gals there with them. It is a joy to be with you, and you're certainly the first lady of the digital movement in the country, and thank you. <laughs> and Bob, wherever you are, Bob, thank you very much. It's a lot of exciting things going on in Ohio that Bob's the, the leader of, and we look forward to, to hearing about what you're going to be doing and look forward to supporting it. It is a pleasure to welcome everybody to the first annual update of Digital Learning Now, what we're what, we're, uh, what we've been up to in the last year. We've asked a whole lot of really smart people, much smarter than at least the former governor of Florida, maybe not the former governor of West Virginia, to give us input about how we could create a roadmap for policymakers. This is not some kind of aspirational thing that's 50,000 feet in the air and you'll get a chance to read it and you'll know exactly what I mean when you see it, uh, to be able to create a roadmap for policymakers to begin to transform their public education systems to embrace digital learning so that the, what we saw with CELCON becomes more of the norm rather than the exception, that it's not some little thing marginalized on the side. Technology uh, has transformed every aspect of our life and it can do so in education. Bob? Thank you, Governor. And I want to thank you very much uh, for convening us all and Sal Khan shows what can be happen, what can happen for every student. Now, how do we make it happen through policy? So we each come to this, Governor Bush, we each come to this gathering, I think, through different paths. Let me share with you one way that I got here, which was several years ago. I woke in a, literally a cold sweat in the middle of the night. It was pretty cold uh, that night in Washington, but because I woke because I'd been running a, number, a bunch of numbers through my mind for, for months. And because we have such a serious, serious situation in education that requires serious and that requires thought and action. And I came to the conclusion in that night that there were three crises we had to face. First is declining state revenues. State budget situations are stagnant. They're going to stay stagnant for the next several years. Federal situation much the same. And, and that what this requires then is that schools across the country are trying to do more with less resources. So. Second crisis, there's a mounting teacher shortage both by subject area and by uh, distribution, by certain regions and in certain areas, particularly subject areas such as math and science, and particularly in, in urban inner city and rural schools. One state, for instance, has 440 high schools and only 88 certified physics teachers. How do we get that, that high quality physics instruction to every one of those schools and those students? And third, for our economy, the increasing demand for highly skilled workers. 
As Governor Bush remarked and said earlier today, we need to apply their knowledge, these workers' knowledge, with, combine it with their content knowledge with deeper learning principles that have the ability to think creatively and to communicate effectively. Schools today simply are not graduating students prepared to enter that global 21st century workforce, and the skills in math, science, engineering, to name a few, are critical. We all know about the international comparisons. We're doing pretty well in swimming, in basketball, uh, in, in rowing, uh, in slalom skiing. But it, it's a different matter when it comes to literacy, when it comes to math, it comes to science. So our nation's destiny and the success of today's students is dependent upon our students graduating with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed. And finally, a fourth crisis. We didn't have enough, so I wanted to add another. And that is that demands attention. And Governor, you've been, you address this a lot uh, and made in progress in Florida, a number of others as well, but that's the achievement gap, something that both of our organizations are very, very concerned about. The moral and the economic obligation to close the achievement gap between children of color and children of uh, low income and poverty. And so this is not only the right thing to do, it's also economically essential to do. No country can be a global leader in, uh, in, in have economic success with huge gaps in education. S as we sit here today, 60% of all of our workforce rec now has, has to have a post-secondary education, and that only goes up. So all students can learn, that's, that's the given. It is our obligation to ensure that they have access to the high quality education preparing them for success. Governor, you're calling together last year the Digital Learning Council was a significant step in that direction. So concerned about these four crises that Bob has brought up and also his cold sweat, which I personally was very concerned about, <laughs> we did convene the Digital Learning Council, 100 plus leaders in education, government, philanthropy, business, technology, think tanks. Uh, we had 40 virtual sessions over a relatively short period of time. It was an amazing, uh, amazingly short period of time. A lot of give and take, a lot of lively discussion, a lot of people passionate about this. I was surprised how passionate people are about this subject. There's a lot of interest in this, and we created uh, the, the results of this effort was to build a consensus around 10 elements of high quality digital learning. Which obviously turns to me. Um, yeah. See, that's the thing about technology is it really enables you to co collaborate. Uh, you can just uh, use, use that page. What the heck? Thanks. Um, Adaptation. The Digital Learning Council established, incidentally, the, the neat thing about a Digital Learning Council, as Giselle says, constitutional framers in some ways, 100 members, all those meetings. Every, all those meetings to put together an incredible document and the key of a digital, successful Digital Learning Council is not one lunch was purchased at any time. So the Digital Learning Council, which developed the 10 elements of high quality digital learning to establish a framework for the 21st century world class education. Focusing on these three general areas, providing customized, personalized learning for each and every student, ensuring a robust offering of high quality educational options with effective instruction, fueled by great teachers, and critically important, providing that infrastructure to support and sustain digital learning. The policy recommendations focused on what states could do. I want to stress that on what states, not the federal government, but on what states could do. And, and to jumpstart the process to a more personalized learning powered by the combination of great teachers and the effective use of technology. These policy recommendations were aspirational. They didn't focus on what could be done quickly, but rather what could be done to bring systemic change to education. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so this year, based on those 10 elements that were kind of broad, uh, broad objectives, uh, we uh, began the development of a roadmap for rep reform for digital learning to help governors and lawmakers, that's what this, the, the foundation that, uh, that I'm involved in is focused on this grinded out work that is to tear down the barriers, the walls of resistance, to create a policy framework so that, you know, there is a Saul Khan in Indiana. I just don't know who that person is, but Saul Khan in Indiana is not gonna be able to 
do work his genius because there's all sorts of impediments that exist on, in, in state laws. And the same applies even in Indiana, those laws are like that. Imagine in the states that have been resistant to reform. And so what we decided to do was to create a roadmap with 72 specific measures that states can use to bring about systemic advanced reform. There are not all 72 criteria are created equal. Uh, there are seven very powerful ones that if they were embraced by a state this year and implemented faithfully over a rapid period of time would create probably the ideal framework because many of the other criteria would then follow suit quite naturally. And those seven are requiring students to demonstrate mastery before moving on, in effect ending social promotion. The Khan Academy uh, application is exactly what that, what that is. Ending seat time. The third one would be providing a robust offering of high quality courses for multiple providers. The fourth would be funding education based, now this is really radical, so hold on, don't, don't be offended anybody, but funding education based on achievement instead of attendance. The, the fifth one would be having the funding follow the student. The sixth one would be to empower students and not school districts to make decisions on taking courses, and the seventh is breaking down the barriers to great teaching. 72 measures is a heck of a lot. Um, it, it's a complicated world, and so we, we, uh, we, we came up with all of these. But in essence, you can create uh, combo packs. Some of you probably, I gave up going to McDonald's a long time ago, as you can tell, I don't need to go to McDonald's. Uh, but you can get a combo pack in places like McDonald's. In terms of education reform, if you applied some of these criteria in a concerted, combined way, you could achieve uh, uh, much of the reforms that are, are necessary to be successful. These combo packs can also provide leaders with a clear path to create a multi-year reform agenda. Um, as former governors, I think we can tell you with certainty that you can't always get what you want completely, but if you start creating a path of, of efforts the success of the reforms with partner, in partnership with the legislature applied faithfully will create the next opportunity for reforms. And so we're trying to create the path for, uh, for policy leaders to do that. We want you to do something though. So the idea that you have to apply all 72 to be successful in this, please don't take it as, as what our objective is. What we would like you to do is go back home and begin to develop strategies to apply part of this and then to develop a strategy for long-term uh, improvement by applying the next iteration and the next iteration of reforms over a multi-year period. Yeah, there is a combo pack for you. <laughs> whatever your situation, whatever your uh, 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 politics and legislative uh, climate, there is, a, there is a pack for you. I remember driving through the drive-through when our kids were younger traveling and Alexandra had one combo pack and Robert got another. But there is one that we can all, that for, for everybody. And so we can take this in chunks that we can handle. So let's talk about uh, pace, path, time, and place. We've talked some about the process, but let's talk about the policy. And incidentally, I just want to say on seat time, um, I'd love to shop for cars. I can't afford them, but once every five or six years. And so, but I've never gone into a showroom and asked for the car that took w exactly 180 days to build. That's all I'm interested in. Did it take 180 days? Uh, n as opposed to give me the mileage, give me the performance, give me that, uh, does it have cup holders? But, but um, <laughs> so <laughs> performance over, over time. So what is digital learning? Digital learning is any type of learning facilitated by technology that gives students some element of control over time over place, over path, and over pace. It still involves great teachers. Great teachers are integral to this process. But it also allows students to have a much more personalized learning experience. Learning is not restricted, as we heard earlier from Sal Khan, to the school day or within the walls of the classroom. The internet and a proliferation of internet access devices have given students the ability to learn anywhere and everywhere, anywhere and all the time. We ban cell phones in schools, it's fascinating to me. We ban cell phones, there's a question that comes up in the classroom and so we send somebody down to the library to look it up when you can immediately access it right there at your seat. Um, you got me. Um, so while virtual learning has been around for decades, and Governor, you were one of the pioneers in Florida uh, in this, New learning technologies are making it possible to personalize learning for each and every student. 
so students can learn in their own style, at their own pace. And simply, doesn't it make more sense than holding a high achieving child back or forcing a struggling student to move on when, they're, when they've not mastered a subject? And so w integral to this whole process is any time, any path, any place, any pace. So let's look at a, uh, what a combo pack could look like in terms of customization. And by the way, all of this impl implies something that is uh, unspoken, but I think is an important element of this, which is it, it requires student accountability and student responsibility, which I think is lacking in public education aid. We do not, uh, we do not expect students to be in control over their own learning. And I guarantee you, if we did that, uh, they would learn with greater accountability to themselves. It would be an empowering experience, and this requires that, I think, over the long haul. But as it relates to customization, uh, a personalized education looks like, looks like this. It requires interactive and adaptive learning technologies, which starts with content. Content can be three-dimensional, it can be interactive, adaptive, aligned with, and it has to be aligned, of course, with academic standards. Technology can make learning interesting and, believe it or not, even fun. Uh, it engages students in their education and can motivate them to achieve. The second component is a robust offering of courses for multiple providers. Technology gives us, uh, as, as Saul Khan again, once, once again is a good example of this, access to a wide array of courses from all over the country, and we shouldn't uh, limit our students to have just one type of content or one course, there should be ample opportunities for students to access high quality content. And the third is that these new learning technologies can also provide real-time data for teachers that can then adjust instruction to meet the unique needs of each student. This is the means by which we move from a adult-centered education system to a customized learning environment where children do learn at the maximum ability that God has given them. This is a pretty cool looking chart. I don't know about yep. you, but I think this is uh, Actually, this is a pack I want. I mean, this You is want this one? Yeah. First, you need to have content and courses uh, full-time and by course for every student. There are lots of ways to achieve that. You can do it through public virtual schools. We have a fantastic one in Florida that I'm very, very proud of. Julie Young is in the crowd. Virtual charters, online instruction programs. The key is that all students should have access. Second, you have to fund it as part of the funding formula. In the last couple of years where states have tried to innovate in this area and they've isolated the funding through line items during tough times, immediately the first thing cut is the innovation uh, and it has stalled out the progress that's necessary. Third, you need to let students pick the courses. As long as school districts have the ability to prevent students from taking digital learning, the system is not going to be improved in terms of quality education. And finally, you need to require students to take an online course at least one to, to graduate from high school. So in order to figure out what this chart is here, it's like having all, all of these things customized together in a combo pack. It's like having a car with a key and gasoline, and that's how the car moves forward. Without, without one, the rest of the process doesn't work. That's why that's a really cool chart. That, it's a wonderful chart. Uh, and so I get the third combo pack, and it's also about what makes that car run, and it's great teaching. Because one of the great misconceptions being perpetuated is that technology is about replacing teaching. It's not, and particularly when we're talking about a blended learning environment, which is, which is digital learning taking place in a fixed location, a brick and mortar location called school. I participated recently in a forum in which I heard Michael Barber say, and I thought quite well, when this, this uh, either or situation was raised, he said, we have, in, we have to stop raising false dichotomies. It's not teaching or technology, it's teaching and technology, and they're inextricably connected. So the fact is that great teachers are actually even more important in the digital age. Effective use of technology and high quality content can help teachers do their job. The military calls it, for soldiers, force multipliers. Can help them do their job more effectively and allow them to spend more, not less time with each child personalizing their learning. Technology allows teachers to maximize their talent, to optimize their time, and to reward success. We saw the chart that Sal Khan has. Now you can 
truly be involved in helping build an individual pathway for each child to maximize their ability. It gives teachers the tools to focus on the one thing that they all want to focus on, great teaching, and they, by extending their reach. Digital learning also gives needed flexibility to schools, whether urban, suburban, or rural, like the one that I mentioned earlier, or even my home state of West Virginia, or any of the other schools in your states, by giving them access to qualified teachers they would otherwise not be exposed to. With technology, there's no reason why a NASA physicist who currently teaches high school physics in Florida could not also teach other students across the country. And let me also add one other thing. Technology also offers our wonderful teachers the opportunity to receive sustained, continuing education, to continue allowing them, to be able, giving them the ability to learn right alongside their students. Benjamin Franklin once said, those who teach learn. And so teachers develop alongside their students and become even better at their jobs. Through pr proper training to use these tools in student learning data, supply, in the student learning data supplied by it, teachers become, and I love this term, We've heard terms about uh, sage on the stage and guides on the side and mentors in the middle, but the teachers truly become educational designers for every student. So next slide is now helping our teachers get this, this new model will require policies and modifications to our current system. The metrics in the second combo pack, now you all took notes and so you're now able immediately to, to send us back what the second combo pack was. There will be a quiz on this. Uh, uh, online, though. Online, that's the only way. Um, uh, and we will know immediately, incidentally, how each of you did. Um, <laughs> the metrics in our second combo pack are from elements 2, 6, and 10, and will help extend the reach and results of great teachers. States that want to recruit and retain effective teachers to support students and teach high quality courses should adopt metrics, take this down, 37, 39, and 69. These will change state, po these, cha these change state policy to allow, allow alternative teacher certifications and reciprocity. For example, to allow that NASA skilled teacher to teach outside Florida. Metric 69 provides, provides funding, funding flexibility so schools can invest in digital contents and digital systems. This begins a transition process from print-based systems to digital. The Digital Learning Council also recognized that creating a meaningful digital learning environment involves working with teachers and their professional development and sustained continuing education is vital to that process. As students learn digitally, so do teachers. We must equip our willing and able teachers for success. So metrics number 40, 41, 68, and 69 provide teachers with professional development and training to maximize that digital learning. Meanwhile, metrics 9, 10, and 11 remove man-made barriers that restrict access to digital learning and effective teachers. Digital learning transcends mountains, lakes, oceans. <laughs> so can we not trans, so that's what nature has put up in, as barriers. Can we not tr simply take down the barriers that we as people have created? Technology removes, technology can help us remove those barriers. And so as we leapfrog all the others, so we have to leapfrog the ones that we have created. The experience of the teacher and instructional needs of the student or students should be the determining factors of a teacher's workload, not outdated bean counter based policies. So if we moved uh, from a culture of, to a culture of achievement by doing, if one state figures out how to do this, I think they'll immediately be in the lead in the transformation, and that is to move from an agrarian calendar to an achievement-based calendar and having the funding be focused on performance rather than seat time. That is the most powerful tool to be a catalyst uh, to move forward. And what would happen, quite simply, if this was done uh, over a sustained period of time, you would have many students that right now are held back that could start college as sophomores, perhaps even juniors, uh, and you'd have many kids who need remediation to continue or drop out, never do it. It would customize the learning experience where you're focused on unique strategies for each student with their unique needs and changing the calendar and changing the funding stream 
perhaps are the most radical elements of all of these proposals, but they're the simplest thing to do. And if you did it, I guarantee you, you would have a thousand flowers blooming in your state. Mal would love it too. So the, uh, the, ne the net result of this is that customized education will empower teachers to be great teachers and will create a culture of achievement rather than a focus on the system itself. And it appears, you know, it seems like these things are impossible. But if you look at history in the United States, we generally have, have been pretty good at transforming institutions that no longer were uh, valid in the times that we were living. Why do we assume that public education, perhaps the most important service, the most important thing for our culture, for our society, for our democracy, for our economy, can't be transformed into the 21st century as well? I believe that all students can learn, and through digital learning, that will be possible. So here's the process that we will uh, unveil right now. Um, there will be the roadmap uh, is outside for you all to review. Um, it will be online as well, particularly how states measure up. We would like to get your comments, uh, policy leaders in each state, get your comments and feedback between now and the end of the year. Uh, we will continue this process of grading to create, to take advantage of this wonderful federalist system we have in our country where states want to excel against each other. There are, believe it or not, rivalries between states. Governors like to outcompete each other. I believe that states will do the same thing in this particular area. Uh, and we will, we will grade states based on the progress they're making as it relates to these 72 criteria. And we need your advice and counsel on how to weight uh, these, these criteria um, as well. But this is going to be something that we will be constantly working on, focusing on making sure that it provides the best resources and the best tools for you all to embrace the digital learning revolution. And Bob, you have another announcement to make well. As I well. do, but Jeb, you've got, I mean, you already, you've asked for suggestions, so I want to be one of the first. It's just came to me. You've pulled all this together. This roadmap cries out for an app. <laughs> <laughs> it the GPS does. for, for uh, digital learning policy. It's hard to get on Apple. <laughs> may have to go to Android. <laughs> That's the wonder of competition. So, uh, so I much know, has happened. I guarantee the Apple guys will be coming to talk to me <laughs> when I'm finished. So much has happened since last year's summit. The 10 elements have been released over the last year, and you've been on the road, I've been on the road, a number of people. We've got uh, several states that have adopted either en masse, uh, Florida has adopted them, the state of West Virginia, I notice. Uh, the new national chair of the National Association of State Boards of Education, Gail Manchin of West Virginia, is here. The state of West Virginia State Board adopted them in toto. Uh, actually, I also adopted them 33 nothing in the Senate. I never could, say 10, I never could get that when I was in office. <laughs> um, but so Utah, Idaho, a number of other states uh, have moved forward on some of these elements. So, so much has happened, that, and so the elements have been released, and today, the roadmap for reform has been released, but we have a long way to go, and yes, we also have a lot to learn. Harnessing the power of technology needs to be done in the right way, the strategic way, to sure we're not just plugging ourselves into different machines and computers, but generating a new kind of learning for our children. Once again, I want to thank G Governor Bush and the Foundation for Excellence in Education for all the work they've done to put this event together. What an incredible convening. For more than a year now, I've had the pleasure to work with Jeb and his team and many others in this room and across the country on digital learning. And I'm pleased that he and a set of other core partners are joining a new Alliance for Excellent Education project on digital learning as well. So I want to enlist you, yes you, in a first time ever initiative to improve and to help imp improve education through technology and great teaching. But I'm going to start by asking you a question. I just want you to visualize for a second, what is it that we want for every student? We want a learning environment that is content rich and experience filled. We want quality teachers that are able to meet each and every student's learning needs. And we want measures of achievement that truly indicates, indicate the student is ready to function in an increasingly complex society. And let me repeat, and what Jeb has driven home at every opportunity, we want it for each and every student. Now some say this is impossible. It hadn't been done before. It can't be accomplished now, particularly 
with growing challenges of budget constraints, teacher shortages, and skill gaps in the workforce. And if our nation continues to provide education in the 21st century as it did in the 20th, the naysayers are right. But now the same wave of innovative technology that has boosted creativity, created vast new job opportunities, and changed our lives is finally beginning to sweep through America's most innovative classrooms. Many of America's teachers are already plugging in to success by embedding digital learning into the total education environment and ensuring that every student leaving their classroom is ready for success in college and career. Simply layering on technology alone will not move the education needle very much. But effective technology combined with great teachers, with rigorous content, and engaged students will transform the world of learning. So tra and traditional classrooms of chalk and blackboards can be transformed into new innovative learning centers. The teachers are here. The technology is everywhere. And many of our students are already wired. So are we ready to put it all together for every school and every student? So this is where we need your help. I want you to remember the date on this slide. Wednesday, February the 1st, 2012. The Alliance for Excellent Education and our partners invite you to join us in observing the first ever National Digital Learning Day to be held Wednesday, February the 1st, 2012. You see our, our new logo? No matter the approach, no matter the grade level, no matter the subject or geographic location, we want teachers, principals, administrators, and students across the country who participate to be using their creativity, innovation, and passion to build their own local digital learning day. We encourage state and local leaders to participate. Many of you already are by the turnout at this event. But we want you to continue to do so on Digital Learning Day, enacting resolutions of support, visiting digital learning sites, encouraging involvement in any way. If a school is using good, good digital learning practices, let's promote them. If they're not, then let's ask them to power up for that one day and see what the potential is. And so enacting resolutions, as I say, resolutions of support, visiting digital learning sites, encouraging involvement, discussion, and yes, taking action into advanced digital learning. You can visit digitallearningday.org to sign up your school or classroom and learn more about how you can be part of this groundbreaking event. And for those of you on Twitter, you can tweet about this event at hash DLD or DLD Day. I never know, haven't been able to do a hashtag very well. We hope you will build this wave of innovation and per for personalized learning and great teaching on Wednesday, February the 1st, 2012. Be there, at least digitally. So Governor Bush, thank you for, for the opportunity for, to be here. You brought so many that are both inside this room and outside of this room to an amazing moment of opportunity. I appreciate the chance to participate in today's event, to make this special announcement, and particularly to roll out this roadmap of reform. Thank you, Bob, and thank you for allowing, uh, thank you for your patience to allow us to do this rollout, and I hope that you'll uh, give us feedback on, on what, you, uh, what you see. Um, I don't think it's uh, all about two old guys that used to be governors. Um, this is not uh, just our view. I think for us, the best view is the perspective of students, and so we'd like to show you a video. I used to think that school is a boring way of learning of what you could have learned on the internet, and that's because everything is reiterated so much. At other schools, the teacher, they'd have to make sure everybody in the class got it, and that could usually mean making sure 30 or 40 kids, half of which weren't even paying attention, would have to get it reiterated and reiterated over and over again until they got it. But at this school, since it's a lot more individualized, if I get something, I just need to prove that I know it, and I can move on to the next thing. I can um, go at a pace that's reasonable for me. At my old school, I felt like I didn't have a say in the pace that I worked at, and I didn't have a say in my education. Using the computer, I can work at my own pace, so if I feel that I need to work on a certain topic for a longer amount of time, I'm able to do that. Or if I feel like it's easy, then I can move on faster. I feel like I have control over my education now. Because I can see my grades 
change minute by minute. So if I see a grade that I dislike or that I want to improve, I can go straight to that class and get that done with like one quiz. And it's kind of, it's more tangible. Like I can see my improvement as opposed to just being told. I love working on a computer. If I had to describe this goal to someone who never went here and never knew about it, I would describe it as a family. Because the teachers care, if you're getting behind in your work, the teachers are there and they're like, hey, you need to do this. You need to stop messing around. My math teacher, it's been my same math teacher since sixth grade. And over that time, he's learned what I have trouble with or what I don't. So over the years, he's helped me with problems that I've had. I went through like a rough patch last year and they didn't just like look at me bad, they actually pulled me in, they're like, what's wrong here? And I told them what was wrong and they're like, we're gonna fix this. And I just got my act together. I felt like I had responsibility and like I have something to look forward to. You have to be really self-motivated. People think that they're just gonna slide by, but teachers don't want that to happen. So you have to want to work and you have to want to achieve your goals. There's no one telling you to like do this or do that. You're expected to do it on your own. Eventually, you just it clicks and you realize that I have to do this if I want to keep up. It's a skill that you're going to need in life later on. It taught me the school actually is useful for something. This school it just made me more motivated to reach my goals in life. So there are some leaders that have been in the forefront of this effort in state capitals across the country, and we'd like to um, allow them to share some of their, um, their stories with you over the last year. The first is Tom Luna, who is the education chief in Idaho. Uh, Bob and I went out to Idaho uh, this past summer to support his efforts. Tom and the governor and the first lady uh, of Idaho are passionate about transforming the state's education system using digital learning. And uh, Tom, I hope that you're wherever you are. Tom, I hope you'll share some of your experiences with the audience. Thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you and Governor Wise for coming to Idaho at a critical time when we were uh, in the midst of moving this legislation forward. Um, first off, uh, you know, like many states, we were faced with the challenge of realizing that for a third year in a row, we were going to see less money for our school system. and we had to figure out how to educate more students at a higher level but with less resources and realizing that the current system could not do that. We realized we had to change the system uh, from uh, comprehensively. Uh, we do not have technology projects in Idaho. We have higher student achievement projects and technology plays a role in that. Uh, and so I, uh, as the governor said, um, the things that I'll describe to you briefly uh, they're not separate line item funding. It's part of our funding formula now uh, because we realize like anything in our lives, technology plays a critical role. So the first thing we did is we made sure that every one of our schools are connected to a high speed broadband intranet connection, not just to each other, but also to our colleges and universities. Uh, that means that no, now, no matter where you live in Idaho, you have access to the highest quality instruction, the highest quality instructors, no matter where they are at. Uh, we, we provide the funding to the districts so that we have a one-to-one -one ratio of computing device to students in all of our high schools. We require all of our high school graduates now to take two online courses to graduate from high school because we think that's an important skill to have when you graduate. If you're going to take full advantage of the college experience or be successful in the workforce, you have to know how to learn in an online environment. So those are some of the things we did and, and some of the things that we're moving forward. Uh, basically, we want our children to have a 21st century classroom, which means that learning is not limited by walls or bell schedules or school calendars. It's not limited by local staffs. Uh, certificates or endorsements are definitely not limited by geography. It means that no matter when or where you are or where you live, you have access to the same high quality instruction as any student, uh, not only in Idaho, but, in, I but in, in the world. So that's some of the things we did in Idaho. And thank you, Governor Bush, for helping us, and but Governor Wise for helping us at a critical time. Hi, I'm Tom Vander Ark, and um, I've had the opportunity to work with the governors and their staffs over the last year, and we've been to a lot of state capitals together. 
Uh, no state made more progress in the last 12 months than Utah. And the reason Utah made so much progress is uh, our friend Robin Bagley and uh, a, a, a bill sponsor uh, that just made a heroic effort, uh, our friend Howard Stevenson. Howard. Thank you. Uh, Senate Bill 65 was a great victory. It took us only one session to get it passed. And we now have online education, which, by the way, fits all 10 elements that have been introduced here today in Utah's online education. We had already in place uh, a state operated monopoly called the Electronic High School. It was a Soviet quality, uh, it, it was terrible. We had 20% completion rate. It was about PDFs online, very non-interactive, and uh, we replaced that. We've ended the tyranny of time and the tyranny of place in students getting competency. The last half of the funding for these online courses only is paid when the students show the competency levels that are required. Uh, Clay Christensen, as you know, has said that the incumbent providers will always resist new disruptive technologies, and that's what we're experiencing in Utah today. There's talk about repealing the legislation. People don't like the fact that uh, we're not double funding these kids. We made that mistake with charter schools. We give a kickback to every district who loses a charter school. We pay them money for the for the phantom student who isn't there anymore. We pay a portion of the money, and we're, we're starting to end that, but we weren't gonna fall into this trap on this. It would have been politically easy to double fund them, say, oh, you can keep all your high school credit money. No, we're taking the entire amount and, and spending it on, the, on these credits that kids are learning online. So we wish you well, and if, uh, if you need any support or or pointers on how to get it through your legislature, just let us know. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> we See if it's, um, do I need yours? <laughs> okay, mine's back on. Another state looking to lead the way in adopting the 10 elements is Arizona. So I'd like to turn it over to Senator Rich Crandall of Mesa, Arizona. Thank you, Mandy. One thing about when you come to this conference, this is my third one I've attended, the governors do not let you come and simply return home. They have some expectations of this. And in Arizona, thanks to, uh, there's a table of Arizona lawmakers right here, great people. We decided that, hey, we want to be one of the first states to fully implement the 10 elements. And so what we did, and, and you may want to consider what we've learned from our experience. We ran a bill. We said, hey, let's create the Digital Learning Center at Arizona. We'll put it at the Arizona Department of Ed, and we'll create a new government bureaucracy to implement digital learning. Bill passes the Arizona Senate 30 to 0. Thanks to Representative Doris Goodale, our House Education Chair over there. I'm the, I'm the Senate Education Chair. It passed the House Education Committee 10 to 0. So we're on our way, and all of a sudden we realize, what are we doing? This is about moving quickly, nimbly. Uh, if something can be created by statute, it can be repealed by statute. We're totally going about this the wrong way. So what we did is we are very fortunate in Arizona to have the Center for the Future of Arizona. It's a think tank. They call themselves a do tank has a tremendous track record of accomplishing great things. We said, you know what? Let's approach them and ask them, will you own the implementation of the 10 digital elements? We're a part-time legislature, just like many of you. I've got kids, I have to have a living, pay for college. I can't wake up every single morning and this be my number one priority. But we can create, we can place that responsibility at this organization. We went to them and said, hey, we, we approached their board, will you own the 10 digital elements? Instead of placing it at the Department of Education, instead of a government bureaucracy, they said, sure, we'll be happy to. Thanks to Intel, Intel's huge. What a great corporate partner to have in your state is Intel. They gave a little bit of money to start it off. And then this group, the very first thing they did, they, they commissioned Arizona State University to find out where is Arizona in digital learning. They're halfway through that study. They'll be done in about two more months. Where are we? And then three weeks ago, thanks again to Intel, we brought 130 leaders, education leaders in Arizona together for the first ever Digital Learning Leadership Summit to focus on these 10 principles. We can't implement all the great things Sal Khan talked about unless we get out of the way with our policies. And the agrarian calendar, that's, a, that's an idea that we could push in Arizona also. So I appreciate my uh, fellow colleague lawmakers over there. Thank you, Rich. Uh, 
I want to take a minute and just make a, a quick plug. And no, I'm not going to talk about my book and my book signing in the lobby, which is happening right after this. <laughs> uh, what, what I do want to remark on is uh, Giselle Huff and I had a quick conversation yesterday at the Philanthropy Roundtable. Giselle and I whispered to each other in the hallway, the conversation is so different this year. Conversation, just not just in the philanthropic community, but in, in American education, is different this year. The, the way this country is thinking about data and the use of technology has changed a lot in the last 12 months. And it's really, uh, a lot of the credit has to go to the two governors that are sitting right here and to their extraordinary staff who put not just this event, but uh, the report card and the roadmap. So Deirdre <laughs> and Patricia, uh, Jaron, Mandy, uh, Chip Slavin from the Alliance. I mean, you, you guys have extraordinary staffs, and I've had the chance to watch them every single week for the last year, so thank you. Give them a hand. <laughs> okay, the Florida went into the year, I uh, have the poll position in digital learning. Utah jumped ahead with, with Howard's bill, but Kelly Stargill made sure that Florida kept its digital learning leadership. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I serve in the Florida House. I have five children, so I understand the importance of education, kids that are still in school. All kinds of, all of our kids learn differently just within my own house. So I have been on board with the revisions and the things that our governor has been doing for the last eight years with pure excitement and part of the reason I ran for office. But what we did this last year was we allowed all of our, um, required all of our high school students to take one year of digital education. I feel like if they learn and before they can graduate, I feel like if they take one class early on in their high school career, they will see the advantages and the opportunities in taking a digital class and then be able to move ahead. We also allowed our great Florida virtual school to offer part-time digital classes to our public school kids in fourth and fifth grade, as well as sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth, you know, all the way up. We also allowed virtual charter schools, so now we can have innovation coming into our state and looking at all the different things that we've got going on across the country and having great opportunities to provide our kids with a great education. Another thing we've done is what they've said to in the um, 10 elements was we're allowing teachers from anywhere in the state of Florida to provide that digital content. We have great engineers and and people in the Space Coast that are now looking for opportunities to get that knowledge out to kids. They now can do that with adjunct teacher uh, opportunities. So we're moving forward in the state of Florida. My utopia world is to have a day where we can have a standard, have a measure to make sure they've met that standard, and how you accomplish that in between and how long it takes doesn't really matter. I think this is me now. <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting ready to close the session and we're not going to be taking Q&A, but I'm going to give you my little uh, personal charge that I give every year on this subject. Technology and digital learning has the power to transform education for every child. But you lawmakers, state education chiefs, governor's offices, you're going to have to change policy to get it out of the way. You have to change your funding formulas your certification policies, you're going to have to change the concept of district attendance. I've got to talk to Representative Stargell about this issue for next year. Why do, you, uh, why do you restrict virtual learning to a school district boundary? The internet is not bound by a school district boundary. So we've got to have you all making those changes uh, back in your state legislatures and we're, we're here. The Alliance for Excellent Education is here. We want to help you through your next legislative session. So let me, uh, if we can give another round of applause to Governor Bush and Governor Wise. 